breathing. It's as simple as that. But not always. Every breath we take tonight on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. We live in an ocean of air composed mostly of nitrogen and oxygen. In order to sustain life, we have to breathe those gases in and out about 23,000 times a day. So when something interferes with that process, we need to be concerned. Tonight we'll look at a variety of infections and lung diseases and treatments for the respiratory system. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. Pick the most likely cause for a chronic cough. Chronic cough. Number one, pneumonia. Number two, reflux esophagitis. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays, originally written for this show, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the winner and the answer at the end of the show, and you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. But we answer your medical questions the whole night long about respiratory infections as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight is pulmonologist and intensivist Dr. Anthony Herricks of Avera Medical Group Pulmonary and Sleep Medicine in Sioux Falls. Tony is also chair of internal medicine at Avera McKinnon Hospital and chair of pulmonary medicine at Avera Heart Hospital. Welcome, Tony. Thanks. So you're originally from what town in South Dakota? Gettysburg. And you've been practicing? Uh, seven years. Seven years in South Dakota. Yep. I know that I think we got you that first year to be on this show, and you've been on the show yep. three, four times at least. Yep. Brian Hurley called me the 19, uh, 2009 model. So The 2009 model. Yep. <laughs> so he used to do your show quite a bit. Yeah. He passed it down to me, I guess. Yeah. So. So um, we look at uh, a lot of problems with lung disease, and, the, and you're an expert in, in these things. What do you think you deal the most with? A little bit of everything. I, my day is a potpourri of cough, shortness of breath, lung disease, sleep, sleep problems, you name it. It's, uh, every day is a little different. And as we did, we spent some time before the show tonight with our pre-med students that help us with answering questions. Uh, you kind of reviewed a lot about sleep apnea. Let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. I think that's the ma major undiagnosed uh, uh, risk factor for heart disease that's out there that, that is it's just sort of ignored by too many people. Do you agree with that comment? Yeah, the, uh, a lot of my referrals actually come from the Vera Heart Hospital and the North Central Heart Physicians. After the heart disease is there. Yeah, they either got to regular heartbeats or they've had a heart attack or the neurologist sent them because of strokes. And uh, yeah, we, it's, it's very highly associated with those problems. And so potentially by finding it early and treating it, you may lessen some risk factors. So. I know the Australian studies show that 6% of these, this large group of people di died over a 13-year period of time who didn't have it, and 33% died who did have it, like a 500% difference over 13 years <clears throat> in young people. So, uh, so it's important to get that diagnosed, and it's all-cause mortality. I mean, it's you know, car wrecks, right. uh, car accidents as, as well, car crashes. Right. Most people that get sent to my clinic are sent by a spouse or somebody that says that they're sleepy, but people are pretty shocked to know that it's associated with diabetes and heart disease and high blood pressure and blood clots and all those kind of things that, uh, you know, maybe by treating it could save their life someday or lessen the risk factor that'll save their life. So. Edema. I see, I see yeah. people with edema. You know, you look at them coming in and you hear them talking and you go, oh boy, I bet you obstruct at night, and indeed they do. Yeah. I remember the heart doctor sent me a guy who had a lot of edema once. Uh, he had an oxygen saturation of 70% when I walked into the clinic that morning. Yeah. <laughs> we sent him to the hospital and we actually took fluid off of him with diuretics, about 60 pounds worth in about a week. And his main reason for having that fluid on was sleep apnea. So, so what is the clue, what is the cue that we have that there is 
uh, problem with sleep apnea. I mean, if you're out there listening, and uh, what would a wife or a husband say to uh, get an idea that there might be sleep apnea in their partner? Well, um, if you catch them when they're taking a nap on the couch or in the chair, if they snore or have what I call crescendo, decrescendo snoring, where it's louder, 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 and then it becomes quieter, 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 and then they may snort themselves awake and go back to sleep. Sometimes just restless sleep. A lot of times people feel like they have restless leg syndrome because they kick their legs a lot in bed. That's a sign that they're getting woken up frequently during the night. You treat the sleep apnea, a lot of times that goes away. You and I, both being men, we talk about getting older, prostate issues, how much we drink. I see a lot of men that wake up and go to the bathroom three, three four times a night. We treat their sleep apnea, a lot of that urination goes away. Yeah, they get to be able to sleep. Well, I'll, you, almost uniformly they'll say, I get up in the night three or four times, not because I need to pee, but because I'm awake, I might as well do it while I'm... Right, while they, I'm, well they blame it on their diuretics, they blame it on drinking an, an extra glass of water before bed. Yeah. But a lot of times I even see it in young men in their 30s and 40s and uh, that just shouldn't happen. So, so how easy <clears throat> is it to diagnose this condition? Well, it's really easy nowadays. If you want to do a screening test that's pretty easy, you can do a clip on the finger called oximetry and we just measure the oxygen at night. The problem with that test, it's not very sensitive. I mean, just because it's negative doesn't mean you don't have sleep apnea. And I've seen people that have had really positive tests that don't have sleep apnea either. Sometimes those patients have COPD or heart failure, which con compounds the problem. Uh, we do a lot of home sleep testing now where you can actually take it home, you put it on, we teach you how to do it, you bring it in, you drop it off the next day, and we can get you a report to tell whether it's there and kind of what severity and what the next steps are. Right. Or you get sent by your primary care provider to the clinic or they order the study and you know, follow it up and you do a formal sleep study in the lab. So. Right. I do, uh, I have used the, the, uh, the sleep, uh, the nighttime O2 sat monitor, mm -hmm. put it on your finger, I mean it's $100 or less than that. It's covered if you have, you know, all those, any of those symptoms. Right, reasons, yeah. And so certainly uh, well worth at least that screening test. Sometimes that's a way to inch in the door because yeah. people look at sleep apnea and they say, boy, I really don't want to wear a CPAP. But, uh, if you kind of prove to them what's going on in the night, show them really how bad things can be with low oxygen levels and how many times they wake up, it definitely can change their change their life in some respects. So you know, you, you talk to people who, who've gotten onto CPAP and they won't get on, they'll carry it where whatever trip they go on, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they will not go without it because it makes them feel so much better. They yeah. sleep better, they're awake during the day. I got a scout leader that ch tasked his scouts with finding a way that he could, without a gas generator, use his CPAP when they were camping in the woods. Oh yeah. <laughs> because he, didn't, he wanted to take it uh, with him. Was so, there a way? I don't know if he ever figured it out, but uh, <laughs> he didn't like the battery. Loud, yeah, he didn't like the, the noise of the generator, especially when they're out in tents and yeah. trying to rough it, but you know, it's a tough he wasn't sleeping without it. Yeah, well, I think, uh, so what message would you give to the people watching about CPAP and sleep apnea that they should remember? Uh, that it is associated not only with daytime sleepiness, which could contribute to car accidents and poor functioning in life, concentration, focus, those kind of things, but uh, it may save your life by preventing strokes, heart attacks, irregular heartbeats, blood clots, there's all kinds of things. So uh, it's a CPAP machine, and I, granted I don't wear one, but uh, it might save your life, and, and most people tolerate it really well. So. Right, it takes a little, a little getting used to, but I mean, there's a 33% death rate versus a 6% death rate in people who have severe apnea and who don't. And it's still 30% if you get a CPAP machine and the machine is under the bed and not being right. used. Yeah. <laughs> you can't use it as a doorstop. So. Yeah. There's some data that said that it wasn't as effective in reducing death rate, I've heard recently in one study. But the other studies that I've read said that it, it brings it right back to normal. Right, well, and, and whether that's true or not, we know that giving CPAP to a subpopulation of people is just as good as adding a medicine for blood pressure. I just saw a gentleman in clinic the other day that saw my PA and got set up on his CPAP. And then when I was talking to him about the other things that can happen, he actually told me, Wow, I did realize that my blood pressure is much easier to control now. So yeah. it can do the same for diabetes and uh, a lot of other health problems. So, so what is it? It's uh, the trilogy of snoring, high blood pressure, and edema, or uh, the third, the third part of it. Typically, is. that so obesity, snoring, 
Obesity, uh, snoring, and, yeah, and uh, high, high blood excess pressure. of daytime sleepiness, high blood pressure, uncontrolled diabetes. You name things. the laundry list, it's there. So. Good. Uh, we're going to talk about COPD. Okay. And uh, we've got about a minute and a half before we have to, we're going to take a, a switch. But let's talk about what COPD is, Tony. So COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And there are three to four diseases out there that can be associated with uh, obstruction of the airways. Essentially what it is is inflammation of the airways that causes them to close off prematurely. You get air trapped in your lungs, it damages the airways and the air sacs, and then you become short of breath and have cough and mucus production and, and poor quality of life. So people who, not every smoker runs up into the problem of COPD, but many do. What, do you have numbers? Well, 15 to 20 percent of the general population who smoke end up with COPD. But there's also obviously other reasons to quit smoking. Uh, there's also about 15 percent of the population that have never smoked that end up with COPD for unknown reasons. So it's actually a very high, ep a big epidemic in our, in, our, in our world. I think it's still the number two leading cause of death. Uh, out there. So there's more reasons. Yeah. I mean, is it, do you think it's environmental or is it an inherited thing? Um, it's a little bit inherited, meaning we know that alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is an enzyme in the body, um, if, you're, if you're deficient of it, can cause COPD, but people who don't smoke that have it can live a normal life. We know that grandma can smoke four packs of cigarettes a day and live forever, and we know grandpa can smoke a half a pack a day for 10 years and die of COPD in his 70s, so we just don't understand why One why that person happens. gets it yeah. worse. We all point at cigarettes, yeah. but and, and it would sure be a better world and less COPD, but not right. completely free of it. Right, it? and our farmers out there with all the chemicals and dust and dirt, we don't really understand this. They develop an obstructive lung disease that we call farmer's lung disease as well, and so they may have never smoked, but is it is it diesel fumes? Is it smoke from the tractor? Is it the dust? dust? The is it chemicals? You know, we just don't know what damages the airways causes those problems. So. All right. Into, uh, or smokers often believe that their lifestyle and work situation put them into a situation where smoking is inevitable. I was in my bathroom and I don't remember too much, but I wasn't breathing. So my brother called 911, and they came and took me to McKinnon. My lung had collapsed, and um, then the other one collapsed, and I have a heck of a time in the mornings trying to breathe. And I do um, two nebulizers in the in the morning, and two at night. Um, one's, a, one's a steroid and uh, the other one's a dual nib. That noise that you hear, it's on three and a quarter, I think, and it helps me breathe. The oxygen goes into my lungs and expands my lungs. And then I have an inhaler. That's just in case of emergency, like if I I'm so glad that I have my portable. It's only four hours that I can be out. But if I have a double battery, I can go out eight. I have got to exercise. That's the most important thing in lung disease and COPD is exercising. I started walking because I've realized that, hey, I'm not going to get any better or, or my lungs are not going to get any better if I don't exercise. But I've been going outside lately. That's the first time in a long time I've been outside, you know, with a friend. She helps me every day walk. I was a smoker, and if I would known what I know now, I'd have never started. Well, when I first started, I was only maybe a pack a week. As I got older, it was two and a half packs a week. Then I was a truck driver, and I was smoking quite a bit. I did it cold turkey. I wasn't going to go through this hell again. I can't explain it, but it, it, it's very scary, and, and you, you just 
want to run and have somebody help you, but you don't know where to run to because you're so scared. You know, uh, for a person to uh, come in front of that camera and be willing to give that story is such a beautiful thing and hard to do. You, you take a huge amount of courage to do it. We thank Sherry Snow so much for her willingness to do this. People hate to admit that there's a problem, and so it's a wonderful thing. She has quite a bit of emphysema. I thought that was interesting that she pointed out that she smoked a lot when she was driving truck. Do you, do you see that a lot? Yeah, uh, that, uh, obviously nicotine is a stimulant, so people use that as, as their way to keep awake. How do you stay awake? awake? Yeah, and then they use it at night before they go to bed, and then they have problems sleeping. So uh, nicotine is used as a, a drug just like everything else, alcohol, amphetamines, you name it. Yeah, there it is. I wanted to mention that this is your show. Your questions are key to our discussion. Call in your questions about respiratory infections or respiratory illness of any kind. Give us a call, 1-888-376-6225, or send us an email at prairiedoc.org. So think about it. We need your calls. Please give us your calls. Um, uh, the, the thing that strikes me is that some people who don't smoke get this. Some people who smoke a little get it. Some people smoke a lot and then they don't get it. I mean, right. uh, so we, we really do point our finger at smoking probably uh, 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 more than perhaps that it's right, but it is really a significant indicator of problems. And so we, we have to make sure that people understand not to smoke. Now, wh where are you with this whole smoking thing and how, how effective are you at in encouraging people to quit? Everybody that comes to my clinic gets a talk, not a lecture. I just kindly <laughs> remind them that we all have bad habits and that they're sometimes hard to break, but uh, you know, you just have to encourage them to do what's right and, and you can't force people to, to do it. You have to tell them you, you gotta come to this on your own because the more we push them into it, sometimes the harder they push back. So. Right, I, you know, certainly. Uh, sometimes I'll say to my uh, patients, particularly uh, older guys, uh, so uh, here is the time, at this point of the visit, I'm supposed to give you a, a, an encouragement to quit smoking. Would you like me to do that? Uh, and would you like me to give you terrible examples of t awful death and dying mm -hmm. and suffering? Or would you just have me leave it alone? No. Give it to me, yeah. lay it on me, I need to hear it, give it to me, or they'll say, don't say a word. Yeah. <laughs> well, the hard part is you're six feet tall and bulletproof when you're younger, and we don't realize the things that we do to our bodies that we're gonna pay for in the end. And a good example is the young lady that was just speaking to us. Right. You know, she didn't really know what she was doing to herself, and, and unfortunately now she's paying for the consequences, which. It, and it's so darn addictive. Yeah. Uh, the people who sell the cigarettes uh, don't care. They are profiting. Yep. 72-year-old man from Vermilion, should a PPI be used for silent reflux? So explain a PPI, proton pump inhibitor. Yep. Proton pump inhibitor, those are your over-the-counter drugs, your Prilosec, your Omeprazole, your Prevacid. They're very potent acid reducers in the stomach. Right. The answer to his question is, is yes. Uh, I will tell you that in my clinic, probably 90% of non-pulmonary cough is actually silent acid reflux. So it's silent. You don't know that you're having heartburn. It's rolling up into your throat. It's hitting your vocal cords. It's making you cough all day. Mm -hmm. and you don't know you have reflux. Yep. It's interesting to say when people are sitting in the clinic, do you clear your throat often? And they look at me and say, well, no, I don't. But yet I watch them and listen to them clear their throat probably 10 or 15 times while they're sitting there. Yeah. It just becomes a <laughs> habit and they don't really realize it. Yeah. But. So uh, actually, uh, not to say that PPIs should be used willy-nilly. Right. But, but uh, they do make a huge difference if you're having reflux. There's other things to do too, though. Yes, there's positional therapy, putting the head of your bed elevated, and that's just not putting two pillows. That's putting wedges under your bed to try to get it up to 30 or 45 degrees. Right, I, I, say, I say four inches of, of books under yeah. the, unless you've got a water bed. It doesn't right. work with a water bed. No, it doesn't work with that, <laughs> pretty heavy. But uh, bricks underneath there, something to raise the head of the bed elevated. 
Sometimes if you can afford to, the specialty beds that'll raise the head up so you're not sliding out of bed can be very helpful to you. So, so then gravity keeps that stuff in your stomach yep. and it doesn't roll up in the night. Yep. And weight loss, avoidance of big heavy belts. Some people will start using suspenders because when they wear a belt they get heartburn. Right. The other thing is, is avoiding uh, meals right before bedtime to allow the acid to kind of calm down. Yeah. Um, problems with proton pump inhibitors or the PPIs is they can decrease absorption of certain electrolytes, uh, calcium for example, which can contribute to osteoporosis. We also know that patients who tr silently or treat their reflux and don't know what they're treating can actually be at high risk of esophageal cancer. If you, if you use it, you can increase gastric overgrowth. So if you treat it and it gets better, you should still follow up with your physician to make right. sure you're followed through. So. so there's times that you would take a scope down there and look. Yep. 68-year-old woman from Vermilion, could you discuss alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? Um, and you did talk a little bit about this before. Uh, of all the people with COPD, and these people can get really bad emphysema is mm -hmm. what it is, this, this big di distended lungs. Yep. What percentage of people who have emphysema do you think or COPD might have this alpha-1 antitrypsin genetic deficiency? Yeah. I don't know off the top of my head percentage-wise how many people have it, but it's probably one of the least diagnosed causes of COPD. There's a big push out there to have people do testing in order to it's find out. It's pushed by the people who have the treatment. Right. Well, there's also push by, there's, a, there's alpha-1 groups out there. You can actually do anonymous testing. So you can go online and find anonymous testing. They'll send you a kit, you send it in. Uh, sometimes it's very beneficial because if you had a tool that could tell you what was going to prevent you from having bad emphysema down the road before you started smoking, you might consider uh, not smoking. Not smoking. So. so that's the big deal. Yeah. Now they have a treatment for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. How effective is that treatment? How proven is that treatment? Uh, the treatment is proven to raise your alpha-1 levels, but it's not proven to improve survival per se. And what is the cost of that medicine? Uh, it is very, very expensive. It's thousands and thousands of dollars. Sometimes you need injections two times a month. Uh, when I wrote an article about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in fellowship, uh, I actually read some cost-effectiveness articles. The problem is, is the cost-benefit ratio, meaning how much it costs for how long you're going to live, is kind of skewed against using it. However, if it can improve patient symptoms, maybe improve their quality of life, maybe slow down the disease process, you really can't hold it from them. No, and through. I wouldn't hold it from them, but you know, I'm kind of a little bit resentful about the company who's selling that expensive drug that hasn't been proved to reduce mortality rate. Right pushing to get the testing. So, I mean, there's two sides of that. Well, but the benefit of getting the testing and finding out early enough is... You won't I mean, smoke. Let's so not smoke. I would say a handful of my patients are actually children of people who have had alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. There's the... Who got referred to me because they were using tobacco and they saw what their mom or dad went through and now want to know, yeah. am I going to suffer the same, same death, right. which is scary. 59-year-old man from Sioux Falls, do you have to be overweight or snore to be diagnosed with sleep apnea? I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night, but I've never been diagnosed. The smart aleck comment that I use in my patients in clinic is, I see people who are four feet tall and 600 pounds who you would think have sleep apnea and don't. And they don't. And I see little old ladies that walk in at 70 years old that weigh 100 pounds and they snore like crazy and have the worst sleep apnea you'd ever see. Yeah. A lot of it's just related to your upper airway anatomy and genetics, which you have no control over it. Right. So just you could order different parrots. Yes, yes, yes. That's it. Sixty-nine-year-old woman from Sioux Falls. Is there a correlation between sleep apnea and dementia? Yes, there is. There are studies have shown that sleep apnea can be associated with Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, memory loss. I get a lot of patients that get referred to me due to decreased concentration, decreased memory, to see if sleep apnea is actually a contributing factor to why they're, why they're around. around. Yeah, why they're having troubles. I, I. I I see that as a significant risk factor, and I, I would strongly encourage, you know, this is an area that has been kind of left alone. Something like 30% of the sleep apnea out there is discovered, and 70% is undefined. Right. Yeah, I'd say 70% of the people that come into my clinic for other reasons are screened for sleep apnea and probably are at high risk of having it. A 78-year-old woman from Sioux Falls diagnosed with interstitial pneumonia wants to know about treatments. Okay, so 
What's the difference between obstructive <clears throat> lung disease and restrictive or interstitial lung disease? So when you have COPD or obstructive lung disease, those are little elastic fibers that are in the lung that keep the lung so they will close, right. get destroyed, and become dilated airways. The lungs become floppy and over distended. The, when you breathe in, you get plenty of air in, but when you breathe out, they collapse, and then you just can't breathe because you're, you're hyperinflated. You're like an overblown balloon. Restrictive lung disease is kind of a restrictive, a, a shrinking lung phenomenon. The lungs, depending on the type that you have, actually harden from the outside in. So the analogy I use is taking a brand new sponge, getting it nice and wet and it's big and fluffy, and then you throw it in the driveway on, on a hot, sunny day. The sponge starts to shrink, it becomes brittle. If you leave it out there long enough, it doesn't hold any water, and so that's the same thing that happens to the lungs. They just don't hold oxygen very well and then you become very short of breath and have a very poor quality of life. I've thought about, uh, and you soak that sponge up with uh, shellac, let it dry, and then the, it just doesn't squeeze right. and it doesn't expand, it right. loses its elasticity. Yep. Um, the interstitial pneumonia, is there anything that we can do for it, and what would be the causes? Well, if I remember correctly, there's, there's 100 different types of yeah. interstitial lung disease. <laughs> the, the more common ones that we see are uh, what we call idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or maybe related to an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis. Interesting enough, we talked about reflux. One of the number one causes of interstitial lung disease in our, in our older population is actually aspiration and regurgitation from reflux. So they have acid into their lungs yeah. every night and then pretty soon yeah, it burns it into a scar. Yeah, and then it gets hard, so. That's, uh, that's amazing. 70-year-old mm -hmm. man from Marion. I'm a 70-year-old male with MS. I'm more, am I more likely to develop lung disease as I age? Well, that's an interesting, it depends upon yeah. the MS, wouldn't you say? Yeah, the, most likely they are neuromuscular diseases or your MS-like diseases, your uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, some of the other uh, neurologic, uh, neurologic problems actually can contribute not necessarily to lung disease in per, se, per se, but actually respiratory failure because of weakness of the respiratory muscles. So there are a lot of patients that are seen in our clinic because of neuromuscular disease to get early evaluation of sleep apnea uh, because we can maybe improve their lung, lung ability to function for a longer period of time if we get them on the right device. That brings us back to the interview with Sherry Snow where she said probably the most important thing that she could do was to exercise so that she kept her muscles strong so that she could use her lungs and it would... So what do you think about the value of exercise? You just said that with neurodegenerative um, mm -hmm. processes. So let me ask you a question. Could you run a marathon today? I'd be, yeah, I could barely do it. I could do it. I'm not far from a half marathon. Okay. So I probably couldn't do it. I probably couldn't do a half a mile. But okay. I use an analogy of a marathon with all my patients. Your marathon is whatever you want it to be. I can take the worst COPD or in my clinic, put them in pulmonary rehab for six weeks. I can double the distance that they're able to walk. The problem is, is when you and I become short of breath when we do something, we say, oh, let's stop. And if we have a heart disease or lung disease, we say, oh, we gotta stop, it's my heart or my lungs. But what we don't realize is it just causes worse deconditioning, and then we become more sedentary and we give our more shorter breath. So the shortness of breath you and I experience is natural. But if we wanna run a marathon, we do a half mile, and then we do a mile, and whatever. And then somebody like Sherry Snow, maybe that's, she does a, a half a block, and then she does a block, and then she does two blocks, and she pushes herself to whatever distance she can get to. That's a very important Most treatment. important thing for anybody with lung disease. Very good. Asthma can occur at any time of your life. When it strikes uh, uh, a healthy teenager, it brings many life changes, however. The first, and I think it's the only attack I've ever had, I was on a run with a friend and we were outside because my asthma is triggered not necessarily by uh, physical exercise, but my allergens because I have really bad allergies. And so what we concluded later happened is that I ran through something that I was allergic to, whether it was pollen or dust or something like that. And it went from very quickly just being like breathing heavily because I was on a run to not being able to breathe at all. And so I immediately stopped running and bent over and was like, Ugh, like just wheezing really, really heavily. And it was really scary, um, especially because I, at that time I didn't really know much about asthma and didn't think that I had it. And that was kind of a, definite turning point. It was like, okay, 
something just caused me to not be able to breathe. We did a breathing test, so it's like a four-stage test, and you do, uh, it's like to measure your lung capacity, and you have a starting point, and you do that, and they measure your lung capacity, and then they introduce you to um, some kind of allergen or something that will trigger an asthma attack, and they do that in four steps, and after each step, they measure uh, your lung capacity after that, and for me, they did the first two sets, and I'd already lost, like, it was like 63% of my lung capacity, so they halted that, and they're like, okay, you're very obviously an asthmatic um, and we went through some like different types of inhalers um, different allergy meds too because mine's really closely tied with my allergies and we kind of concluded what would be the best practice and method for me to handle it and we decided since it was a pretty severe case of asthma to do a strong maintenance inhaler four times a day every day and then I had an emergency inhaler for situations like when I was on the run or before exercise or if I'm feeling sick to use that one accordingly. Um, and so, and I've gone back and we've changed the medicines I take and stuff just to fit my lifestyle more. It's pretty controlled. It flares up when I get sick or during allergy season, but it's not anywhere near what it used to be. I had a, the sinus surgery a few years ago and that really helped um, just kind of, cause like my sinuses and my allergies and my asthma are all kind of tied together. So the, between that and the maintenance inhalers and stuff like that, I've really been able to get a handle on it. And um, I'm not afraid of running anymore. It's not something that I worry about. And allergy season's not nearly as stressful. And well, that's interesting. Uh, so. I had childhood asthma, and this young woman discovered she has, had asthma in college age. Is there a time that people learn that they have asthma more than others? No. I mean, in my clinic, it could be somebody who had childhood asthma. They grew out of it in adolescence, and then they got it back in adulthood. I've seen patients who never had any asthma symptoms as a child, and now they're 70 years old, and they have horrible reactive airways disease or asthma on their breathing test. So what's the difference between COPD, you can't get the air out, obstructive lung disease, and asthma, you can't get the air out, obstructive lung disease? What's the difference? The type of inflammation that's there, and we know that in asthma, the airways close off, and when you give albuterol, you get a significantly bigger response to open up the airways to allow people to breathe better. We also know by giving inhaled steroids, or oral steroids, you can actually alter the disease process. The only thing that alters COPD is not smoking, if you're talking about it from a smoker's lung standpoint. What alters asthma is avoiding your triggers, taking your medications like you're supposed to, and you can live to a healthy life and never have any lung problems. So, so people who have mild asthma can be treated by just using as-needed rescue inhalers, right? Yep. They start getting bad, you need to add the inhaled steroids, right? Yep. Would you explain that? So the, actually the National Institute of Health has the GINA asthma guidelines, and what they say is mild intermittent asthma, rare symptoms, mild persistent asthma, symptoms a few times a year, moderate persistent symptoms daily or weekly, and severe persistent means you just can't do anything. You just step therapy up to get the disease controlled, and you step it back down and put them on the lowest doses of medication. Some of my patients are on the same thing year round, other ones, we step it up in the fall, we step it up in the spring, and we step down in the other times of the year. The danger I've heard is that the beta agonists, you know, the albuterol, the bronchodilators that give you immediate relief, if they're used enough or long enough or high enough doses, it can make, it carries with it a higher risk of death from asthma. Why would that be, and what do you do to prevent that? Well, there's, there's a little bit of argument out there. If you look at the little black box warning, which can come with your prescriptions, and there's a little box that tells you what you should do with your medications, and whether they're bad or not. The concern is, is, is the beta agonist, the albuterols, the ventolin, the Proair, the Proventil, the Zopinex, are they bad for you with asthma? And the answer is no, they're actually good. They'll rescue you from your symptoms. The problem is, is, is the death from asthma related to excessive medication use? or is it due to poorly controlled asthma? 
there's a group of people that feel that it's probably a combination of both. Yeah. There's some that think it's medication, some re think it's uncontrolled disease. So. I'm, I'm one in the, uh, in the, uh, the ballpark of, of uh, that if you use albuterol, it should be a rescue. If you're needing it a lot, then you better be on the steroids. Right. And, and uh, you're th there, I know that. But the question is, did the albuterol trigger things? And I know for a long time, I used it at night, and I, it was a crutch to sleep. I used one puff of albuterol, and I could breathe better, and I could go to sleep, and so I just depended on it. It took me maybe three or four months to gradually get off of it and realize I really didn't need it to sleep. I just became dependent on it. Well, and you and I both, or for example, me who doesn't have asthma, I can take albuterol and may open up my lungs. And when you have something like asthma, you get that fear of what it is to have an asthma attack, and so then it can sometimes be a crutch. That you use more routinely. So yeah. So the point I'm I'm trying to share with you is don't depend on it. And I like the idea of moving on to the steroids when you need. Mm -hmm. Now, if you treat uh, emphysema, sometimes you'll use albuterol in combination with a um, a muscarinic drug. Mm -hmm. Would you explain that? So there are several receptors in the airways that cause them to open up, and that's what we're trying to do. Is how much airway can you open up to allow air to get in and out better. And even the smallest change in your pulmonary function studies, as the young lady was talking about, can actually decrease shortness of breath. So albuterol works on what we call the beta receptors to open it up. The anti-muscarinic agents like ipatropium or combivant, which is a combination of albuterol, uh, your spirevas, your enoros, those kind of medications will open it a different mechanism. So a combination together may actually improve symptoms. Right. How do you treat bronchiectasis? Well, what is bronchiectasis, Tony? Bronchiectasis is related to multiple different causes. Essentially what it is, instead of having a nice rigid airway like a straw, it becomes very floppy, and so the airways become dilated. And instead of clearing mucus out of them, the mucus pools, and that sets you up for recurrent infections. So infection can trigger it, and infection can cause it to get worse. So you, buy, you treat it the same way you do COPD and asthma, and it's essentially airway clearance, you get never, the mucus out. I know that sometimes people resect that. They go in surgically remove because it's so bad that no matter what you do, you're not going to get that clear. Yeah, and that, those are the patients that have horrible disease that are set up for recurrent infections. Actually can be life-threatening, and sometimes with all that damage to the airways, they can start bleeding in their airways, and so just cutting out the dead lung is the best thing you can do for them. Cutting out the dead lung. I've been diagnosed with chronic bronchitis. I've been coughing more lately. Should I be concerned? And is there a treatment that may help? Chronic bronchitis, uh, excuse me, but is a garbage term for a chronic cough. The problem is, is it could be asthma. It could be something called non-asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis, where the airways are lined with uh, white blood cells that cause allergies. So it's like an allergic bronchitis. It could be reflux. It could be post-nasal drainage. So the question is, is what is the cause? Because if you're treating the wrong thing, you'll never get better. Right. And sometimes there's more than one thing that causes it. So go to your doctor and get a more correct diagnosis. Chronic bronchitis is a kind of a catch bag. Right. That's why I said it's yeah, garbage. Garbage, yeah. garbage, yeah. garbage Throw bag. everything in the bag and call it what it is. 60-year-old woman from Wakanda, her husband had sleep apnea for 15 years, then a heart attack at 54, then he no longer had sleep apnea after the heart attack. Why did that happen? Was he tested or did he just not snore and obstruct anymore? I don't know. But That's it may well be that... Weight loss, um, you know, it's hard to say. Yeah. It all depends on the severity of the obstructive sleep apnea and, you know, one, t one sleep study may not absolutely rule out sleep apnea. So there are a lot of factors when I read them. Do they sleep well? Did they get on their back? So right. who knows? It makes me think about how some people have too much fluid and if you can get that fluid out, then the obstruction uh, decreases. We have an email question. I'm a 64-year-old male with sleep apnea and sarcoidosis. That, that's a great diagnosis, sarcoidosis, and it's one of those lung diseases that you know a lot about. I have lost 40 pounds, rarely snore anymore. Do I still need the CPAP machine? You know, I have a number of people who lost weight since they were put on a CPAP machine. Problem's gone, I don't need that CPAP machine anymore. The best thing to do is go get tested again to make sure it's gone because even though you lose weight, it may not fix the problem. It may lessen the problem, but uh, like I said, there are people, who, the best studies have been with bariatric surgery. So you take somebody who has m super obesity, 
they lose several hundred pounds and you do their sleep study, they, they will get better, you may not cure it. Right. What about sarcoidosis? Let's talk very quickly about the diagnosis and, and what can you do for it. Well, it's kind of an autoimmune disease, but not really. And why I say that is, is that an autoimmune disease means you have antibodies in the body that attack our own cells. This occurs inside the body where the body starts attacking it, but we don't know what causes it. And you get little collections of white blood cells that settle in tissues like the heart, the liver, the lungs, the skin, the eyes. The brain. And, yeah, the brain, and it causes uh, damage to those tissues, and that scar tissue can cause organ damage and, and cause uh, increased uh, risk of problems. And we don't know why, no. why it happens. You would think that we would know by now. Oh, well, there's been plenty of studies. And the <laughs> University of Iowa used to look into it. They thought beryllium, aluminum, um, there are all kinds of things, tree sap, you name it. Tree sap, you know, Northern Europeans uh, uh, were, are the ones that really do it. So, 70-year-old uh, woman from Webster, can you please explain pulmonary fibrosis? We talked a little bit about this earlier. It's just hardening of the lungs, and we don't really know why. Some people have an idiopathic form where they're just, the lungs start to harden from the outside in, and, and the little air sacs that should be able to get air in and out can't anymore, and then you develop the low oxygen levels and shortness of breath. Yeah, this scarring that happens, we talked about it earlier, that scarring occurs and we don't know what the heck is doing it. Right. It's like automatic scarring, some cause. How much of the uh, lung problems do you think occur from fungus uh, that looks like this? Fungus is very rare to cause lung problems unless you're immunocompromised, meaning you, you have diabetes or you're on medications that lower your immune system. You hear a lot about black mold. Right. Uh, that was actually published, uh, uh, the CDC looked into it with a bunch of kids that died at a very young age and, and retrospectively they looked back and found out maybe black mold was associated with it. But they kind of looked at how that was investigated and it's probably not real. So yeah. mold is an issue, it can cause some problems with breathing, but it's... I think it triggers an asthma. Like right, thing, doesn't it, it, right. Than... The, and the smell that you get is actually a volatile acid when you smell mold, and that actually causes airway irritation more than the mold actually causes problems unless you get a large volume of it or your immune system can't keep up. I've, I've heard that the black mold thing is really kind of a little bit of an overblown, kind of a hoaxy thing. It profited a lot of people who were cleaning out black mold. On the other hand, you don't know for sure and therefore you do it and wh where are you at with that? Well, and, uh, the studies were actually, I think it was in Detroit, there were three kids that died prematurely and they didn't know why they died. So they went in and they tried to look and they found out there was black mold that these kids were exposed to and they died of a respiratory problem. That's, that's what you said. But the problem is, is when they went back and they looked at how the data was collected, it was maybe true, true and related or maybe it was true, true and unrelated. But there's no evidence that the stachybotrys or that kind of fungus that's associated with black mold actually is really going to cause any significant disease in you and I. I mean, there's a lot of it, yeah. and it, and people do just fine. Yeah. I mean, and I've talked with Mark Bubach, the allergist, and and uh, Tom Luzier, the allergist, and they both go, eh, not yeah. that big of a deal. Yeah. Woman from Pierre, I was wondering if I could use dental devices instead of CPAP. Okay, dental devices. Um, if you order them online, may fix snoring, but they may not fix the problem. If you go to a dentist and have one put on, it may be beneficial. I always quote patients about a 30 to 80 percent effectiveness. That just means if you have the right airway, you get the right device, you get it adjusted appropriately, it may benefit you. But if you do get a dental device, I always recommend going back to the sleep lab. Make sure you're adequately treated because if you're not, you've just got an expensive mouthpiece. Yeah, I've, I have seen that some people felt like it helped them a great deal, but later on, yeah. you know, the, when we tested them, didn't. Yeah. And, and I've read they should be only used for mild uh, obstructive sleep apnea, not for moderate to severe. It all depends on where the obstruction is. If it's just be because your jaw is set back a little bit and it obstructs your airway when everything relaxes, pulling the jaw forward may pick, fix may the worst sleep apnea there is. Right. Problem is if the obstruction is below the jaw or behind the nose or some other reason, you can pull it out as far as you want, it won't fix the problem. Right. So. All right. 86-year-old uh, uh, who has never smoked has an oxygen level that's at least 97, but I cough up phlegm quite often, but not during the night. Worse in the morning and evening, somewhat yellow, especially in the morning. So 
could this person who never smoked, it's good oxygenation, but he's bringing up a lot of phlegm, what, what would you recommend? Well, I would recommend probably making sure that he doesn't have chronic bronchitis, which it could be related to other things. It could be well, acid reflux. Could be acid reflux is what I was thinking. A sleep, uh, I mean, not a sleep, uh, but a pulmonary function test yeah. might help you. Yeah, that'll rule out any emphysema that could be associated with it. Uh, it could be that previous infections or exposures, maybe he's got bronchiectasis or dilated airways. You know, the, the, the whole issue is if it's persistent and troublesome, it should probably be looked into. So there are a lot of reasons for cough. Yeah. More than just what we but did on our quiz. What would be the, your list of cough? <coughs> well, in general, an acute cough is something that lasts less than three weeks. That's your <coughs> pneumonias, your bronchitis, your asthma attacks, uh, your allergies. It lasts between three and eight weeks, it's kind of subacute, and so it could be something like a pneumonia is resolved, but you still have a bronchitis, or maybe your asthma is still acting up. Most of the time when they get to me, it's uh, more than eight weeks and it's a chronic cough. ACE inhibitors like lisinopril or quinopril or prinavil or any of those medications, number one cause of drug-induced cough. Uh, tobacco smoke exposure and chronic bronchitis. Asthma, the non-asthmatic or allergic bronchitis that we talked about with the eosinophils. Acid reflux is probably number one. And then there's something I jokingly call little old lady syndrome. Next time you go to the mall or the grocery store, just look at how many women walk around with a Kleenex dabbing their nose. Us men, we just wipe it off with our sleeve and uh, keep from moving on. So. But as we get older, we develop a little bit of a drippy nose and that can drip down the back of the throat and cause cough as well. So treating those things are very beneficial. If you don't treat those things or you do treat those things and people don't get better, then you gotta look at more sinister things. So. Right. Sinister. 86-year-old woman from Sioux Falls, does treating with CPAP lead to cerebral, ap to cerebral apnea? Central apnea is what she's probably thinking. There are some people out there that when you, when you put them on a CPAP machine, they will develop more central events. There's a big argument amongst the sleep people. So, so explain the difference between obstructive okay. apnea and central apnea. So obstructive apnea is when you go to sleep at night, your airway closes off, so your brain goes from a deep sleep to a less deep sleep back and forth, taking you in and out of sleep to try to keep your airway open. If you put a CPAP machine on, which pushes the airway open, you no longer obstruct, you feel more rested. Right. So in some people, when you put that CPAP on and you open up their airway, their brain just forgets to breathe. We call that complex sleep apnea. Some people who have complex sleep apnea, if you put them on a CPAP long enough, those central events will go away. Others, they might persist. You just have to use a different device to treat them if they're still there. It's that central apnea, that drive to breathe thing that, that happens. You, do we have any reason why that occurs? Uh, sometimes it can be related to neurologic issues, strokes, uh, those kind of things. Other times it's related to congestive heart failure. They, I love the story. It was called Andine's Curse, which uh, Andine cursed the goddess who had, who had done him a wrong and, and made that, or actually it was a man. Anyway, the, the, the god or the, or the half god uh, had to remember to breathe, mm -hmm. couldn't uh, breathe without uh, so quick, uh, let's move on, but that's a great yeah. fun on Dean's curse. 82-year-old man from Harrisburg, I've recently in the hospital for pneumonia. How long should I wait before I go back to exercise? That's a great question. You can start exercising whenever you want to start exercising. I like exercise. Exercise is the number one prescription in my clinic. I just wish I would do it myself. Okay, great. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. Pick the more likely cause for chronic cough. One, pneumonia or reflux esophagitis. We said chronic cough. The answer is two, reflux esophagitis. Do you agree with that, Tony? Yes. And explain that a little bit further. When your stomach produces acid, most of the time it goes what I call south down through the intestines. And some of us, do we have a sphincter or a little closure at the top of our stomach that prevents acid and, and food and everything to go up into our esophagus. When that acid refluxes up, it can be non-acid, it can be acid, it can be fumes, but it irritates the back of the throat, back of the nose, causes nasal drainage. And a chronic cough. Yep. It was Sheila Gunderson from Sioux Falls who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Sheila, for participating, and a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. All around town, from stores to playgrounds, babies are on the move. 
And there are diseases that are on the move too. And some of these spread easily. To best protect him from 14 serious diseases by the time he turns two years old, vaccinate him according to the recommended schedule so he can go on about his business and you can have peace of mind. For more reasons to vaccinate, talk to your child's doctor or go to cdc.gov forward slash vaccines. Mr. C, a 56-year-old fellow, came into my office because he was experiencing shortness of breath with any exertion and was hoping we could fix it. He admitted that he's been smoking about one and a half packs a day for 40 years, and lately he's been trying to cut down. Multiplying 40 times one and a half gives him a 60-pack year history of smoking, which is a lot. He's also inhaled a great deal of hog and hay dust over all these years. He said his symptoms have been coming on over the last five years, and now his heart beats fast with any exertion. His cough is getting worse, and for a year he's been coughing up some pretty ugly stuff first thing in the morning, but the rest of the day he just can't get it up. Lately, he's been wheezing more, and his chest gets tight, especially at night when he's trying to sleep. Breathing tests demonstrated that he can inhale okay, but it takes some pushing and time to exhale. Blood tests show high levels of hemoglobin, low levels of oxygen, and the chest x-ray showed overexpanded lungs. These are changes indicating the diagnosis of emphysema combined with chronic bronchitis, also called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. This is not good news for Mr. C because COPD is the third leading cause of premature death in the United States and a major cause for a miserable disability. Normally in the lungs, airway tubes branch out, multiply, and become progressively smaller until they reach tiny little air sacs called alveoli, which are covered with microscopic blood vessels. It's here where inhaled air touches blood. It's the place of an almost magical switcheroo. Life-giving oxygen is passed from air into blood in an exchange where the waste product, carbon dioxide, is passed from blood into air. With COPD, the walls of the tiny air sacs first lose their elasticity and then are destroyed, leaving larger, non-functioning cavities. Also, airways that are supposed to carry air to the alveoli become blocked because of inflammatory swelling and mucus. Trying to help him, I encouraged Mr. C to quit smoking, prescribed a medicine to help him quit, and provided an inhaler to turn off inflammation and dilate those bronchial tubes. The end of this sad story is that he has a condition we can help but not fix. And if he doesn't stop smoking, I predict that it won't be long before he will die short of breath. Well, a big thank you to our guest, Tony Herricks, for volunteering to travel to our studio and help us with tonight's show. Thank, thank you, you so much, Tony. Now a reminder about the Domestic Violence Institute hosted by the South Dakota Network Against Family Violence and Sexual Assault. That will be held at the Swiftel Center in Brookings October the 4th and October the 5th. We're rapidly approaching our flu season here in the Midwest. Prevention is key to avoid the worst. Do not delay. Get your flu vaccine now to reduce your chances of catching the flu bug. Well, that does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Doc after hours.
We had some great questions submitted beyond what we could answer during the broadcast portion of the show, so let's just try to get those answered. Uh, An email question came in. Any comment on the use of ginger in some, of, some form to help acid reflux and digestive trouble? I don't know necessarily about that. I know if you look online, you can Google it, you'll find out that ginger will actually help with motion sickness and, and things like that, but uh, there are also some uh, some vinegar solutions that people use for reflux, but I think the biggest and most important thing you can take from acid reflux is if you have a lot of symptoms, you should probably seek help from your doctor because it's not something you want to mess with. Right, and I think in the long run, over-the-counter omeprazole is really the, is probably the most staid answer. Elevate the head of the bed, yeah. though, I would say that's number one. Yeah. Uh, I've heard wintergreen for GI tract and, and spearmint, those kinds yep. of things. Have you heard that? Yeah, mint for whatever reason mint. helps with nausea as well. Can mm -hmm. maybe help with reflux, but again, acid reflux, you worry about esophageal cancer, it's not something you want to just willy-nilly treat. Right. 65-year-old woman from Rapid City, I've not been able to sleep for more than two hours at a time. Where would be the closest to Rapid City for getting the sleep test? Uh, I'm sure you could get uh, with the pulmonologist group there or your primary care provider to send you somebody who's a sleep specialist and get evaluated to see right. whether you have sleep apnea or something else that's yep. causing you to wake. There's pulmonologists in Rapid. Yep. Go there. Get it tested. An 84-year-old man from Worthington, I had a pneumonia shot in the last few <coughs> years and now the doctors are saying that my right lung is only functioning at 90%. And my left is functioning at 80%. I received two nebulizer treatments a day. Uh, however, the treatment is expensive. Is there any alternative treatments, and has anyone seen a similar reaction? Now, I don't think that the pneumonia vaccine has ever caused any lung problems. Um, I think it helps to prevent you from having significant lung problems and can decrease death, especially in our pediatric and elderly population. Right. But the lung function abnormalities are probably related to some other reason. Right. And what are we recommending, Prevnar, uh, for anybody 65 and older, and then follow a year later with Pneumovax? Yep. And if you're immunocompetent or excuse me, immunocompromised, such as uh, you have a bone marrow transplant, they recommend Prevnar sooner. If you've got the Pneumovax before the age of 65, they recommend another one after the age of 65. But there's a lot of, you know, before or after Prevnar stuff that you have to look at. So. Yep. Prevnar is the main one right now. Yep. Um, I think the guy's 90% of his lungs are working. I mean, that's pretty yeah, good, yeah. really. Actually, normal pulmonary function, if you and I were to do spirometry, as you know, anything above 80 is normal, so. Pretty close to normal. Yep. Um, I, I don't know why the problem of uh, I mean, nebulizers. Anyway. Well, the problem with nebulizers and inhalers, there aren't too many generics on the market. So talking with your pharmacy to find out what is covered and uh, depending on your age, you know, is that Medicare uh, supplement that pays or mm -hmm. Medicare Part B? Right. Sometimes going down a different route will help you. There's been some recent diagnosis of RSV, and I've seen it in the adult population last winter. Mm -hmm. what, what do you know about RSV? I mean, it's typically kids, and but what's the story about it? Well, RSV, we, we get it. We just don't get it as severe as children get it. So every patient that comes into the hospital that we see on our pulmonary service from about October till March gets a viral respiratory panel. We see uh, influenza, parainfluenza, RSV, human metanumavirus, which is a new one out there that causes a lot of problems. So it's just a viral infection, and sometimes if your immune system's down, it can make you really sick. You can, and then pneumonia follows, Yeah, and that can kill you. Some of those viruses actually alter the white blood cell function that sets you up for secondary bacterial pneumonia and uh, can be very severe. So do you recommend RSV vaccinations in adults or I don't I think we I don't do know like that this. there's any literature out there on that. Via email, I use a CPAP and since I started using it, it seems that I have developed a tendency to have ear discomfort or ear infections. Any association between the two and what do you know about that? The eustachian tube, which is a canal that drains from inside the eardrum down to the back of the throat. Well, um, can sometimes become inflamed because of sinus issues and those kind of things. So typically when you get an ear infection, obviously that area is obstructed and pus builds up in there and sets you up. So sometimes people just have an intolerance to CPAP because it'll fill up the ear with air and cause lots of pressure. Whether it's truly causing an infection is probably hard to say. Okay. 
Any particular <coughs> comments about influenza and influenza vaccinations that you would say? Um, it's herd immunization, meaning that if everybody were to get immunized, the chance of getting influenza would be much, much less, and the death rate of influenza would be much, much less. There's good evidence out there that getting your flu shot can be beneficial at either preventing it or lessening the risk of severity. So you, it's a little poke in the arm, you should get it. Obviously there's some evidence out there that the nasal spray in kids isn't beneficial, so they're just gonna have to have that little uh, little needle there and, and get over it. But it's, a, actually I've heard that the, the, the majority of the infections that, that, get, that kill elderly come from little kids. Yep. And that the Prevnar and vaccinations in kids have saved thousands and thousands <coughs> of lives of, of adults. Yep. I mean, that, that's just it. All it takes is one person to not get immunized, get influenza, and then you spread it to somebody else. And it's a... Particularly the elderly yep. who are immunocompromised just yep. by their age. Yep. Uh, any particular take-home messages that you want to uh, finish with? No more questions. No. If you think you have sleep apnea, get tested. If you're smoking, stop. Very good. Well, we thank you so much for You're joining welcome. us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on our website and appreciate all your questions and the opportunity to answer them. Until next time, from all of us at On Call with the Prairie Docs, stay healthy out there, people. Eyesight. We take a look at glaucoma and eye care. Next time, On Call with the Prairie Doc. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota State Medical Association, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care, Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Regional Health, Swiftel Communications.